Okay, here we are on uh, Tuesday. I'm getting ready for Wednesday, and this is the message for tomorrow, which is the 16th of September, believe it or not, and 2020. And we're moving into the end of the year, and lots of um, very exciting things happening and around the world. We are, um, we are looking at difficulties uh, that are difficult to surmount. And yet we have faith in Christ that he's bringing us through in a plan. And uh, we, we look around the world and we find um, sources of evil and we find sources of good. And those seem to be still a part of our lives that we can't escape. So let's join together in prayer. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the good things about today and help us keep our minds on the things you've given us permission to think about. The moment we start thinking about anything else, Lord, there's uh, confusion and discouragement hopelessness and depression that we'll see occurring in the Sanhedrin and the leaders of Israel this time in this scripture. We pray, God, that you'll help rescue us from that and be resting and trusting in you for everything and understanding that you're the one who's in authority over everything, not the whimsical nature of human beings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're on doing John eleven forty nine 49 through 53. And, uh, now we've come to the place where Jesus has raised, uh, spoken to Lazarus in the grave, and he has asked him to come out of the grave, and sure enough, lo and behold, he pops out of the grave, and he's fine. And they take his grave clothes off, and uh, and I don't know, they didn't say he danced any, but I think he probably danced a little bit. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'd dance if I came out of the tomb, I'd probably be singing too. And, and and I was dead, and then I came back to life suddenly, and everything was fine. That's kind of scary, weird. I mean, that'd be a time for rejoicing, for sure. So anyway, this is a response of the Sanhedrin, which is a combination of the Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees the uh, high priests, and the, all the people in authority who were governing, who were responsible for the safety of the people of Israel and making sure the laws and guidance were in compliance with God's word in their, uh, uh, at least their interpretation of it and their opinion. And they're very, very st stubbornly holding on to an opinion that they, they can't justify. They don't have, they have evidence to the contrary, and yet they're ignoring that ev evidence. And even seeing Jesus as a very dangerous threat, and the last verse we read says they believe that Jesus, if he wasn't to be, st if he was to continue as he was, the Roman Empire would rise up against the Jewish nation and eradicate them completely, take away their temple, temple, and they'd lose their culture totally. That is a completely irrational statement that is coming out of the mouth of someone who is clearly in darkness and not concerned about what God thinks. They're concerned about their own opinion. And this is the dilemma that we all have that we'll be looking at today. So that's Hebrews, excuse me, John 11, 49 through 53. Then one of them said, then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. Now, that is a true statement. <laughs> None of us know anything at all. We start making conclusions about things, then we don't have enough information to justify it. We're off on... Uh, strange, we create weird dilemmas for ourselves. This is just exactly what they're doing here. It says, well, he spoke up. It says, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better uh, for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for the nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one again. So the day, so from that day they on, they plotted to take his life. Uh, Caiaphas is refusing to uh, see Jesus as anything other than a man. He's, he refers to Jesus as a man. So it's better if we kill one man and uh, then prevent the Roman army or the Roman you know, occupiers from destroying our country completely because they've occupied us and we are helpless. And in fact, these people were cooperating 
with the, the uh, Roman Empire, and they had formed an alliance with the Roman Empire, such that the Roman Empire was occupying and allowing them to govern uh, as they had before. Now, if Jesus were to take over, he did not have any alliance at all with the Roman government. They didn't see him as important at all. And if he were to take all the people away from these leaders, the Roman government would see that as an insurrection in his mind. And they would wind up with a situation where a whole lot of people were going to die. Okay? that And there's two, two things they have to think about here that they think there are only two choices. And there may be, have been only two choices. I want to explore that a little bit. So like all weak men, they feel that something must be done and are perfectly unable to say what. They don't know what to do. And we see that still in our world today. But someone has to make a decision. Someone has to, to take action. And uh, they admit that Christ is doing miracle after miracle after miracle. And he does some, he said, this man does many miracles, yet they are rec not recognizing his identity or his mission. They, they don't understand it. Uh, they're being disobedient to their own law. They've broken their own laws and what they have taught. And the people have noticed this. They're losing credibility because they're not, they're hypocrites. And their, their hypocrisy is being displayed by the way they respond to what Jesus is doing. The, and, and the people are saying, who are these guys? And we thought they were for us, but it's obviously they're, they're not even following their own laws and they expect us to follow them. And Jesus has exposed this very clearly and that's very embarrassing, of course. So they have a lot of fear in them. And they're not following their own laws and they're being disobedient. They fear that any disturbance will cause repercussions from Rome lead to loss of their culture and generally uh, disperse them further into the rest of the world because that's what the Roman government would do. They would conquer, divide, and then move people away. And this has been a history throughout for several, for prior uh, hundred years or so, several hundred years where they were conquered by another nation and then dispersed out into the whole world. So there are Jewish people in every community now in the world and, and he's talking about the bringing them all back. And he's saying that if we crucify Jesus, all, the, all of the Jewish people that are all over the world dispersed and sent away will be united again. What rationale led him to that conclusion is, is not documented, and it lies beyond my understanding, most certainly. So since he's doing all of these things, it fills them with fear. And this fear is pure self-interest. It is not patriotism, and it is not religious. It's opinion, selfish opinion, based on what the individuals believe is true, and all they can see is that they're going to lose some freedom that they have now and, and damage the nation and their position of power because Jesus is going to usurp it because he's the king of the Jews. They don't want another king, and that scares them because the Roman Empire ain't going to put another king anywhere. You know, that, that won't work for them. So they're discussing this, and the fear that they have, as I said, is pure selfishness and self-interest. It isn't the concern for the nation. It isn't concern for their health. It isn't putting other people first. It's distorted, and they may believe that they're doing the right thing, but indeed they're just protecting themselves. So they're steeped in an unsolvable dilemma causing confusion and indecision. And we see that uh, in our world all over the place even now. So um, a dilemma is an argument forcing an opponent to choose either of one of two unfavorable alternatives. And in our cultures, we are always being forced by political processes to make a decision uh, between two human beings 
or two ideologies that are mutually exclusive, that are against each other or are polarized. And we see that pretty much in every nation of the world. And here we see it in this, in this example of the Sanhedrin meeting and facing this dilemma. The dilemma, as I said, is being forced into a place where you have to make a decision and your two decisions that are available to you are equally damaging to you and your nation. Now, this is what they're deciding. The dilemmas, the two choices they have to make is fairly simple. They, uh, they can make the choice of uh, allowing Jesus to do whatever he wants to do and then let the Roman Empire do what they do and let the people do what they do and see what, how they fit into it once it's all over with. And uh, we know that that would probably end in the same result as what happened. This is the hard thing to understand that, that somehow or other we've gotten to a place where we have two choices and either choice is a bad choice. Either choice, neither choice will cause these, um, this nation to go in a different direction. There will be a consequence for both those choices. So the first choice is leave them alone and not do anything. The consequence in their minds appears to be a loss of national identity, a loss of authority, a loss of of power and a, a loss of their position. They don't know what the consequence is going to be. So they're extrapolating in their mind what w they think will happen, which has no basis in any fact other than just what they think. It isn't based, it's a based in human opinion. And that human opinion is skewed toward what you feel comfortable with, not what's true. So that's what these people are doing. The other choice is to stop this man from continuing with well, the minute they do that. They're risking a revolution, an uprising that they could be usurped and taken, had the authority could be taken away from them and they could wind up uh, being in the same situation either way. So they had two choices. They couldn't decide. They're in this meeting arguing about, but what if we do this? But if we do this, then we have this. And what this one, I'm going to have to, you know, there's no good choice, period. It's a dilemma. And this, we bring ourselves into these dilemmas all the time in our lives. And it divides us, it, it, it damages our relationships, it, it separates us, and we've created it by our choices and our opinions. And this is what these people have done, what the leaders have done by, by establishing laws and then breaking their own laws and being hypocritical. And now they want to put Jesus, now somebody's got to make a decision, that's what I'm saying. Okay, the high priest, he's kind of like the president of the United States or the president of another country or, or a dictator in the country. When nobody can agree, it falls to somebody to make a decision. And, and Caiaphas is that person. He is forced into a situation where he has to decide, finally, in order to stop the chaos, whether to crucify Jesus or to let him go on the way he is. He makes a decision that we need to crucify him. We need to put him to death. We need to stop him. And the, he thinks that's the best of two uh, answers. And and that's one of the things I've heard before. People say, well, we got to make the, the, uh, make a choice uh, that's the lesser of two evils. So we have two evils. What we don't realize is that predestination and free will combine together and working simultaneously together, it's going to lead us to the same place, no matter who is in charge or what decisions are being made. So there was no way that Christ was not going to be put on the cross and crucified and his body destroyed. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. It's very confusing why that's necessary and why this choice was something that the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas were forced into because of the choices that had, had happened before. So the inability to see any safe response to the actions of Jesus caused a stalemate. The high priest was assigned to make the decision, so he made the decision. And he had already said before that this is what, would, that this is what we need to do. And he refers to Jesus as a man, so he thinks we put this man to death, and then we'll have power over the Roman Empire somehow. We won't lose our nation. How? I don't know. There was no plan. You know, we like to see a plan when somebody's in authority over us. 
is going to do something that affects all of our lives for eternity for the rest of our known life and then it's going to change everything we like to know what the plan is however there was no plan it was just this is what we're going to do somebody had to make a decision and of course in that condition when you have two choices and you're going to have the same result from either choice uh, what whatever decision is going to result in the same consequence why is that it's because uh, I'm going to write, I, I've written what I think is the cause, and I'm going to run through this. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something I struggled with this morning to understand. So, um, uh, here we are looking at the maturity of fruit. From seeds planted long ago. Seeds of thought, belief, and deed. Every event includes three, these three elements. And they combine to be like a seed that is being planted. And um, these uh, seeds are motivated by self-interest rather than the concern for others as Christ has told us to follow. Not pleasing ourselves at the expense of others, but seeking God and just keeping our mind stayed on what he's told us. It's safe to think. So the the things allowed, the false beliefs and deeds are motivated by self-interest. They lead to uh, forced conclusions. Caiaphas made a forced conclusion. Even commentators I read this morning said he was forced into that decision to tell them he had to make a decision and the decision, either decision was good. The decision was to crucify Jesus Christ. And so they plotted and they began the plot. We'll be talking about the unfolding of that. But in the midst of this, I think the theme that we're moving into with John is the way that uh, free will and, and predestination are combining together and not mu mutually exclusive like we think they are. We think it's either one or the other. In the kingdom of God, things are possible that are not possible with our under, uh, in our world or, or understandable. And I don't expect anybody to understand what I'm saying. But I've come into the conclusion that we've got two things going on. Free will is true. Predestination is true. Somehow they're intermixed in such a way that the plan that God has established is being unfolded before us. And the consequence and the results are something we have very little power of because of our past, our personal past choices, because of the leadership's past choices. What have been, has been done had a consequence on the nation, and the nation is suffering. And they are going to suffer more until Christ is conquered, uh, Christ is killed and put in the grave, and then resurrects to heal every, to place an opportunity upon all of us to escape all this insanity and trying to understand something that's beyond our understanding and then making conclusion, feeling forced into a conclusion that it's, 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 it's not any better than any other conclusion. I, I work very hard at not making a decision about things. I say, people say, what do you think? And I say, I don't think. <laughs> because, because if I don't have enough information, Really, personal first-hand information that I can confirm is true. I don't know who's telling me the truth. I don't know who's lying. So if I run into some kind of political position or thinking pattern that other people have imposed upon me, and I've, I'm forced into to making a conclusion, that, and that conclusion is not the accurate conclusion. It, either one of them, neither choice is going to be the right answer. The same thing with what they're doing. Both of them, neither choice was a good answer, and both of them had the same consequence. So here we're looking at this maturity of fruit. What fruit are we talking about? Both choices that they have will end in the same result because the seed has matured into, because what they have planted in the past in their behavior and attitude and beliefs and how to run their nation and how to know God, and how to impose a, a law upon people to control and create a civil civilization, a civil society. They planted seeds and are now maturing into this condition where they are forced into a decision to crucify Christ. And we always come into the dilemma 
of being forced into a conclusion that actually Christ or God knew was going to happen a long time ago because his plan is unfolding. He is not predestining it. He sees how it is predestined by our choices while we are involved in free will. So our ancestors planted seeds and those seeds have grown and matured and they were based on self-interest. And you can look at the history of any nation, self-interest, uh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and 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 several places in James and others I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, they all um, have have decried this this issue that we're discussing and this confusion that the Sanhedrin's are in, and we're we're often in also when we're making decisions and we don't have enough information to justify a conclusion, but we ju we jump to a conclusion based on our own self interests, and this is rampantly happening in everybody's lives. And it always produces a fruit. What's the fruit? We don't know what the fruit's going to be. We think our opinion is good and is right. What's the consequence in our relationships? What's the consequence in our, in our society? What's the consequence in, uh, in our political position or our church or our own personal lives down the road? What's the consequence? Is our decision based on per personal selfish preference or is it based on the plan that God has given us and following the guidelines that he has given us for what we can think safely and what we cannot think safely? And he's made it very clear in scripture. We just don't pay attention and we don't want to do it. So anyway, this fruit has matured that I'm talking about. Uh, and we have scriptures that talk about this also. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, the point is, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So we're, when we're sowing, uh, we're sowing seeds. And the seeds are made up of all the attitude, all the, all the uh, beliefs we have, all the permissions we give, all the decisions, all the votes we cast. All the things that we deem as perfect are kind of rolled up in and wrapped up in a seed that's planted and it produces fruit down the, sometimes decades, sometimes generations down the road. You know, I know seeds were planted in our nation long ago that are giving uh, some of our enemies power over us because we embrace them as friends when they are enemies. <laughs> And so we have going to have a consequence. We're going to have a maturing of that fruit into some kind of consequence in our future. Same in our lives. If we carry on with uh, misbehavior in a relationship and we maybe get away with that for decades, there will be a reckoning. There will be a time when all of that collapses on you because you've been sowing seeds to corruption. And that's what Galatians 6, 8 talks about. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. And there is so much information about this in the Bible that is overwhelming to me as I began to see into the fullness of this, this uh, way that free will and predestination can combine into a consequence that is the fruit that the scripture is talking about now. And it's based on all our choices. When we choose to disobey God and we take our own action, that is logged in as a seed, along with everybody else planting seeds. And then it all grows up into some consequence and you can't escape it. Once it matures, you can't change the fruit. If I, if I, if I plant an apple seed, I'm going to get apples. If I plant an apple seed and expect to get tangerines, Ain't going to happen. Now, we're planting seeds and we don't like the fruit because we we planted them through corruption, selfish self-interest to to please our own sensibilities rather than to to uh, obey and follow and trust God that he's got a plan and the plan is overarching and it's all uh, going to wind up in the same place because he's in charge of it. And we look at these minor events that are happening year after year in our own world. We don't like them. We don't like things that are going the way they are. We see a deterioration right now. We're looking at 
th smoke so thick it's unhealthy to breathe in Spokane, Washington, throughout the western United States. The, the whole, the whole, all the states are on fire, out of control. Why? This is a fruit that is coming from the seeds that have been planted in California, in Washington, and in Oregon by our society for hundreds of years. And it is going to, it has gotten worse every year. The fires have gotten worse. The only way we can do that, we can fix it, is to go to God and help us with the consequences of our foolish decisions and our selfish decisions. So just know that thoughts, and my, my hope is that you will just know and recognize that thoughts, actions, and beliefs combine to form a seed that's planted and has an inevitable outcome. So Caiaphas found himself with the fruit of hundreds of years of misunderstanding who God is, of imposing tyr tyrannical requirements with the Ten Commandments upon the people, of one class of people exalting themselves to a place they had all the wealth and the people, the rest of the people are suffering. And they were getting away with it generation after generation. They got away with it. And, but there was a reckoning. And this is a day of reckoning. So Caiaphas has matured fruit. It has to be picked. And it's corrupted. Not because anything one person did, but because of what everybody did. Everybody decided. And the conflict of the, of the pettiness within their own mind, trying to please themselves, not understanding that that's the seed they were planting that would lead to corruption and produce bad fruit. So God has told us how to live so that we do not sow corrupt seed that produces unhealthy fruit in our lives. And that unhealthy fruit can be the damage of relationship. It can be the uh, it can lead to civil war. Uh, it can it can lead to disasters in our in our land where we mismanage the land and we wind up with uh, famines or floods or fires because we've we have, we haven't been good husband. We haven't taken care of the land properly. Um, you know every kind every action every word every deed is planting a seed that's going to have fruit. And we don't like the fruit. We didn't think about the fact that we were planting a seed by what we said or did. And now we have a consequence we don't like, and it's corrupt. And that's what they caught themselves. This is what I'm seeing. They predestined themselves into this bondage. Human beings from the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, had predestined this to occur because a second Adam had to come to undo this flaw in us where we reason, we think, and then we conclude and we make bad mistakes and damage ourselves and others. And this is very difficult for us to do. We know we're doing it usually. We're not, not aware so now the Sanhedrin are lying in a bed of hopelessness with no option uh, for a good result. Both choices are equally corrupt because they are the product of seeds that have grown into full bloom. And not only full bloom, but they have been nurtured along the way, have been fed, and now they have corrupt fruit. They don't have the fruit that they thought they were going to get, and they didn't even know how to understand what the fruit would be. And Caiaphas is completely incorrect in what would happen. The same thing had to happen in either decision. Christ would have been crucified. And, and we, I don't know how the other choice would have played out. Maybe the Romans would have crucified him or, you know, I don't know, but somehow or other, he would have wound up being crucified because that, that was the fruit that had been sown, uh, had been grown and now had matured it was time for Christ to Christ to uh, come die for us and raise from the dead 
So he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he has given us freedom from bondage to human tradition or to making conclusions about things uh, that we don't have enough information to decide on. He's told us in Isaiah 58, Philippians 4, 8, 11, Hebrews 11, 6, and James 1, through, 1, 14 through 15, how to avoid the trap of making conclusions uh, that are not warranted, uh, that are fleshly or selfish or, or based on human understanding that has nothing to do with eternal eternity and the plan that God you are uh, God is unfolding before our very eyes right and everything that's happening is is bringing us just like at the time of Christ everything that happened everything that anyone did brought uh, brought them to the very thing they didn't want to have happen because they had sown the seed that had created the dynamics that produced the fruit that made it happen and that's predestination and free will working together. Let's join together in prayer. Father God, it goes way beyond my understanding how to fully communicate this difficult message. I know the, 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 there is a raging controversy about these two things. And God has told us to keep our minds stayed on him, to focus on Jesus Christ and serving him to consider others more important than ourselves and to take, loose the bonds of people that are suffering and to trust God uh, that he has got the situation well in hand and everything that's happening is orchestrated to end in the result he has planned to have happen, to break the bondage of death, hell, and the grave and to give us freedom and in eternity forever from all of this. Yet we persistently choose to ask why and to let our minds dwell on things that are unproductive. So I pray, God, that you would touch hearts today, that you would move with your Holy Spirit on all that are listening, and that you would enable each one to see that the seeds they're planting today in their attitude and their actions and their beliefs formulate a, a growth pattern that will lead to producing either good fruit or bad fruit. Lord, I pray that you'll help us see that and live that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Very good. Yeah,